It's another lay best book video. Let's get it! Hi everyone, it's Jenny. Welcome back to my channel. How are you all doing? Hopefully not sick of me yet. So, here we go. Best books of the year so far. Very exciting. Pick 10. Wasn't too difficult actually. Normally, at least the last few years, I, th I think I've always found the first half of the year is when I pick the bulk of my best books. So I'm interested to see if this year will be the other way around. So, no particular auto. I'm going to talk about the audiobooks first. So the first one is A Single Thread by Tracy Chevalier. I enjoyed this more than The Girl with the Pearl Earring. So that's quite high praise. This is about Violet, who is one of the surplus women post World War One, so it's in the interwar years, which I always think is a really interesting period of history that isn't done enough. People always just focus on world wars. But it's about her trying to find independence from her overbearing mother because there aren't enough men to go around and marry. And that obviously was mostly a woman's way out. And it's partly about um, her starting an office job and being lonely and then starting the Broderers group after she goes to cathedral and encounters someone there and decides that she wants to help embroider cushions and su such forth and just things for the cathedral. And that is where she finds a community and friendship. And there's just some great, great characters in there. There's a, there's a lesbian couple. It's very progressive. It doesn't look gratuitous at all there in there. And I just loved the story. There's forbidden love. There's just so much in it and it was so, so fascinating to read historical fiction set in that time and, and also just looking at women in that way and, and how, you know, women were paid less for doing the same job that they had less opportunities for promotion, less opportunities for work in general and being a single woman, you know, you had to work hard to make ends meet, living on your own and that was just something that I think a lot of people do think about, that not everyone had a choice, not everyone could get married. So that was a problem that was apparent even in the Victorian era so I really really loved that and the kind of challenge about what a woman's life could be and what a woman's life was in the 20th century so that was great. The next book I do have a physical copy of but it's at my dad's and since he lives all the way up in Yorkshire I'm not gonna go get it for this video so that is Colson Whitehead's The Nickel Boys which I know got so much deserved praise I think it won the Pulitzer Prize I sure hope it did and it is about two black boys Elwood and Jack, or Jack Turner, Elwood and Turner, I think they're mainly called in the book, and it is about how they're imprisoned in a correctional institute for young men, young boys, and Elwood particularly is a good student, he is only imprisoned because he is riding in a stolen car on the way to university lectures, so it's a lot about the racism that is so apparent in the legislation and in the execution of the law in America but also about I think it's I think it's in Florida I think it is in Florida and um it's about them trying to survive trigger warnings for violence and racial racial violence because there there are some pretty brutally described beatings in that book but it's so brilliant it has an incredible twist at the end that I loved I did not I, I did not see it coming at all and um it's just so much about oh, what it's like and how hard it is to be a black young man growing up in America and it just feels so relevant now. I know it's based on a true story on a place that I think was only revealed as lately as the 2010s by a university about the awful conditions and treatment of the incarcerated there. So it's oh, just so powerful and really really stayed with me i i feel like i can't describe it very well because i don't really say too much but it's just so worth reading absolutely would me recommend that so so much and then completely different onto my non-fiction audiobooks i listened to mudlarking by i think it's laura meeklum and uh it was brilliant i was quite skeptical i would like it at first but it is her talking about London history in a way and uh, also I guess part memoir because it's about her experiences of mudlarking which is when you go to the shore at low tide and you hunt through the washed up debris uh, of what the, what the Thames brings and each chapter is a section of the Thames which I love so you have a chapter on Greenwich and a chapter on London Bridge and all, all, all the different parts of the Thames in London which 
if you know London or if you like London, it's just such a, an innovative and original way to learn about London through the things that wash up there over time. She talks about the things that she's found, everything from Roman pottery to my favourite thing, which is about dove type, which is a, a font that was created, I think it was in the 18th century, I can't remember now, but it was a, about her finding like a comma and certain letters. And I think the title of the book is actually in that font, which is really hard to find. and about things that are washed up there from New Zealand and, and she also talks about her friends and what they hunt for and some who hunt for jewels specifically or all the you know all the pipes she's collected and so if you get the paperback I know especially it, it has pictures of some of the things that she's found but I would really recommend following her on Instagram it's so interesting you can see what she's found sometimes you can see her searching and you'll see you know a stretch of land she'll say can you find this and I can never see it and then she just picks it up and I think wow she just has so much knowledge about the things that she finds that she can date them easily she has given some things to museums but it's just a wonderful way of learning about the city but then also about how therapeutic it was for her and how good it was for her mental health I, I just loved it I I kind of thought oh mud larking is like such a Victorian thing to do that impoverished children would do to try and find money or things that they could sell but this is different and just fascinating so loved that then also i read home homecoming i want to say home going but that is a novel that is not the same by colin grant which is i think the subtitle is voices of Win the windrush generation and this just feels very relevant it also it has been kind of updated or um i think when he was writing it the windrush scandal happened so it it's great because it starts not just about when, when people of the Windrush generation who were people from Jamaica and the West Indies moved to the UK in the 50s and 60s and that kind of time, but it, it talks about them and their perceptions of England and what, what it was like preparing and thinking about moving, making such a huge move while they were in the West Indies. And it isn't just about Jamaica. And I loved that. I loved the range of voices and, um, I loved how it really does track that whole journey, the process of it, of what it was like before they left, leaving, being on the journey, arriving, and then growing up and having, you know, future generations grow up in Britain, be British and that kind of thing. Uh, and then it talks about Wonder Scandal as well. I highly recommend the audiobook because you get the sense of the voices and the accents and that's really fun, really brings it alive. And gives you a sense that you know they're real people that have lived through this experience and it was just a great piece of like, British history to learn about. The last book I don't have because I listened to an audiobook is My Name Is Why by Lem Sisse which is his memoir of growing up as an adopted child in Britain and what that was like being black because this is several decades ago now and how he was so horrifically mismanaged by the care system completely let down especially when he was put into care homes and what it was like to find out about his mother and his real name and his heritage and all those things and it's just a very powerful read because I am lucky enough to not have gone through the trauma of being passed through adopted parents who then reject me and then send me into different care homes so it, it was just a real eye-opener and again example of how racism has affected generations of black people in this country and not to like make it sound really depressing or anything but it's just a really really well written book and I love how because he's a poet each chapter has a little poem at the beginning it's just nice to hear him read that out loud so I think if you like memoirs this is a great one to read for sure and then we're on to the physical books so this is in no order by the way I should have you know been sensible and talked about them in the order I read them but no who wants to be sensible? So this is At the Pond, Swimming at the Hampstead Ladies Pond. This is such a delightful book. If you like nature writing, this is the one for you. If you like memoir and nature writing, this is the book for you. And also London, uh, you know, love books by London. And um, I can't remember how many essays there are. It's something like 10? No, it's more than 10. It is, wait. This is 14 different writers talking about their experiences with the ladies pond throughout the season so i think it starts to start in autumn i think it starts in autumn 
No, it starts in winter. I never get that right. Winter actually, I think, is a favourite season that they wrote about. But it goes through from winter to summer and, you know, all the seasons about the changes in the setting, but also some of them just don't write about the pond. Some of them use that to write about different bodies of water that they swam in around the world. Some, one of them writes about gender spaces and the difficulty of being trans when you have at the you know men's pool and the women's pool and like where do you fit in there the, about how it becomes a liminal space i really really enjoyed this but some just write about their experiences of swimming in the pool and or being a lifeguard or that kind of thing and it's just a really beautiful space to write about and how it's so immersed in nature it's i love this cover as well it's just a lovely gentle read and also great to discover new writers I haven't read any of his writers before, and a really good diverse range of authors too. So yeah, this is just a great gift, I think, for someone. Loved this, absolutely loved this. Then, oh, very different but though. The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath, which I can't flip it believe I haven't read before, because I'm pretty certain I got this for my 17th birthday. It only took me, what, eight, nine years to flip and read it. But I feel like it's one of the life-changing books. I think it is my favorite. Not my favourite, one of my favourite books of all time, for sure. It is such an, in an incredibly astute and articulate way of writing about mental health. In fact, I would like to read you an extract, if I can find it. So this is her writing about the response to a friend talking about her body and what is and isn't normal. Oh, it's, no, actually, sorry, it's talking to a nurse. There we go. I wanted to tell her that if only something were wrong with my body, I would be fine. I would rather have anything wrong with my body than something wrong with my head. But the idea seemed so involved and wearisome that I didn't say anything. I only burrowed down further in the bed. And the whole analogy of the bell jar is the idea that you kind of suffocate and you can't breathe and you, when you're mentally ill and you're depressed and you're being suicidal how you are just trapped in your own thoughts and your own air the idea that you're not getting fresh air you're not you're not getting nourishment and sustenance and that kind of thing and i just thought that was really clever sorry i just said what it's about it's about is it esther yes esther greenwood who is a promising student who has been given this opportunity to be in new york for the summer and, and I, I suppose essentially get a kind of internship and how she could, has a breakdown really and how she's trying to deal with that potential success that she's teaching on the brink of and the pressure of that and the expectations of that and subsequently having really dark suicidal thoughts so obviously a huge trigger warnings for suicidal thoughts and mental health and all that, all that stuff but it's a really wonderful book and i want to say also it's not all doom and gloom it is a little bit hopeful so I just thought it was exquisite. I don't always get her poetry, I'll be honest. Some There's quite a lot of sort of path poetry, though I haven't read that much, to be honest. I don't get some recently I've read. I thought, oh yeah, that's good. But her novel is incredible. And I'm so sad she didn't write more. I'm so, so sad. Because I think I would have loved any novel she would have written. I think her poetry and the poetic images really work in the novel. I just think she should have written novels, not poetry, it, essentially, is what I'm saying. Maybe that's blasphemy. I don't know. Anyway, on to Old Baggage by Lissa Evans, which was a flipping joy. This is set, I want to say 1920s, 1928, and it focuses on Matty, or Matilda, Matilda, uh, who is a woman who was a suffragette, and she's now in a kind of limbo because women have got the vote. So there's not an obvious thing to be fighting for. Obviously, feminism, it's still alive, but she's in this difficult, kind of purposeless state now, where she's not sure how to progress and what to do next and what to focus her attention on, especially when she has lunch with one of her friends who kind of points out, well, do you know what? Lots of women may have the vote, but now you don't necessarily know what to do with it or who you'd vote for. You still vote for whoever your husband votes for. So how do you inspire women to become more politically engaged? That's sort of what she's questioning, what she's trying to solve. So she creates this kind of women's group and then uh, hilarity and <laughs> uh, fun adventures ensue. And um, 
she's just such a fantastic character and again nice because she's a, she's a bit older and there's lots of other wonderful characters too and this is a prequel to Crooked Heart which I have but have not read yet and it introduces at the end a character that is the protagonist Noel in Crooked Heart so I need to read that one soon and I hope it will be just as good but this is just such an engaging read and again a fun historical fiction book I don't read many books set in the 1920s in Britain so it's just always interesting to read it the, the sense that you know women have freedom because it's a roaring 20s but also they don't know what to do with it necessarily so such a good fun read and then a book oh a book that I think is also a new favourite of all time oh my gosh you guys, this is Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine Everisto, and I feel like everyone, everyone has been talking to me about this, and I'm very, very, very late to the parte for this, but it is a book that talks, or goes through 12 women's lives who, as you go through the book, gradually become more and more interlinked, and it spans a lot of time. Actually, there are like multiple generations of women in here, which I really loved, and also it covers you know, the UK. But it's very, it's mainly about black women in Britain. There are a few white characters in here, but not that many. And it's just a beautiful story of a sisterhood and um, different experiences and, and attitudes, and how that is affected by what generation you're part of and your experiences and your um, level of income. My favourite was probably Carol who is the four story in here and apparently that's the one she wrote first that makes sense it's probably the most crafted it is very um i suppose lyrical i, I suppose it's like prose fiction or fusion fiction as it's called if you can see it has no full stops apart from at the end of each part and i thought that would really put me off i thought oh it's going to be pretentious it's just going to annoy me but actually no it's fine because it does feel very crafted and very deliberate and it's just such a special read. The ending made me cry. I just felt such a sense of amazement at the end of it, just how it was all brought together. I just loved it so much because it was so hyped. I didn't read this. I, I heard about the book way before the booker. I wanted to read way before the booker. I bought it when it was shortlisted for the booker. And I'm still really mad that this didn't just win outright because I do think it's better than the Testament and I've read both. I really do think it's better. Especially in the sense of even if you don't like it as much, I think it's more innovative as a book and it's just so good. And I want everyone who hasn't to read it, but I know it's hard sometimes when a book's so hyped to know if you'll like it and sometimes it makes you more critical of it or it maybe you like it less, but I did not find that with this book and that made me so flippin' happy. So yes just cannot recommend this enough. I recommended this woman in a book drop and she bought it. I thought that was my good deed of the day. So good, so good. Okay, and then last but not least, we have Glass Town by Isabel Greenberg, which is a graphic novel about the Bronte. And Glass Town was a world that they created. They had lots of fantasy worlds that they would write stories for. And I just love her work. She has just, such a way, a fantastic way of, of imagining these stories and these, you know, this real family because it, it goes through um, their childhood but it's, it's focusing on Charlotte since she was the one that sadly survived her siblings and it's partly about her kind of being tempted to come into this world and um, her relationship with each other with, with each of the siblings and the different different worlds they created and how Anna and Emily had their kind of world and then and um they have worlds that they all wrote for it like Gondor and I just loved it so much and how I felt like you know it was really oh it's so beautiful I love I love this colour palette she always has lovely lovely colour palettes but I, I liked how she took something that you know was factual in the sense that they did write these things and you can read some of their writings. I've actually I've seen some of them at the Bronte Parsonage Museum and the most minuscule writing you've ever seen. Incredible. But anyway, I like how she took that and then, and then she created a kind of fiction out of it that still feels very true to the Brontes but is still very imaginative and it was just a joy to read. She's one of my favourite, probably my favourite um, illustrator and um, graphic novelist. I love, love her work. Maybe because I've only read, I've read three of hers and most people have haven't read more than one by them, but this was so good. Anyway, that is enough. 
of that I think let me know what you have read this year that is your favourite book if any of these are your favourite books have you enjoyed the girl or another it's okay if you didn't but I'm a little sad because I want everyone to enjoy it because I think it's so good and I will see what my favourite books are at the end of the year and how many of these actually end up on my favourite because there's a lot of good ones here but I have since read some very good ones as well so it's going to be a tough choose for sure anyway I will see you soon on Bookish Shenanigans Bye!